Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Architecture. It is great to have everybody here, and this is going to be a wonderful, wonderful talk. My name is Jill Lerner. I am the AIA New York chapter president this year, 2013. And the AIA New York chapter is proud to host Design in the New Heart of New York, presented by the related companies and Oxford Properties Group here at the Center for Architecture's Breakthrough Space Gallery. And I hope you've all had a chance to see the exhibit upstairs. And just uh, to let you know, tonight's program will last till about 7 o'clock. And after that, everyone is open. welcome to join us in a public reception in the Breakthrough Gallery hosted by Related. Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome William Pedersen, FAIA, and Joseph Giovannini for a conversation on commercial office building, a dominant component in the modern city. This event is the first of a fantastic eight-week speaker series with a full lineup of architects, designers, and civic leaders involved in the Hudson Yards project who are engaging with the architectural community and the public on the plans for the Hudson Yards for the very first time. Please pick up a postcard and mark your calendar for the subsequent events. Of course, as a principal at KPF myself, it is particularly delightful to welcome Bill here to speak at the center. We are especially excited to present this evening's program as part of NYC by Design, a new citywide design festival taking place from May 10th through May 21st. The Center for Architecture is pleased to be taking part and is hosting events each day during the festival. Coming up, join us for Cocktails and Conversations at 6.30 on Friday, May 17th with Brad Klopfeld, Klopfeld and David Van Der Leer. On Saturday, May 18th, join us from 4 to 7 for Booming Burrows, Redesigning, Aging in Place, in New York City. We hope you will join us for these exciting upcoming events. Without further ado, I would like to welcome this evening's moderator, Joseph Giovannini. Joseph heads Giovannini Associates, a design firm based in New York and Los Angeles. He holds a master in architecture from Harvard's GSD. He has taught advanced and graduate studios at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, UCLA's Graduate School of Architecture and Urban Planning, and at USC, and at, at the University of Innsbruck. Most importantly, and most knowledgeable from my perspective, Mr. Giovannini has written on architecture and design for three decades for such publications as the New York Times, Architectural Record, Art in America, Art Forum, and Architecture Magazine. He has also served as the architecture critic for New York Magazine and the LA Herald Examiner. Published design projects have appeared in Architectural Digest, the, the LA Times Magazine, the New York Times, A Plus U, Domus, House and Garden, GA Houses, Architecture, and Sites and Interior Design. So with that, I welcome Jeff. Thank you. Joseph. Thank you very much. Um, it's my honor to introduce Bill Pedersen. Um, we've known each other for about 30 years. Um, uh, uh, three decades ago, I attended a lecture in Los Angeles presented by Bill and two of his colleagues. And it, was, um, it seemed to be the firm that we were missing in Los Angeles that we, we really didn't have. It was really questioning the high rise in a way that I hadn't seen done by uh, the, the, the local architects. I was jealous of New York made me want to come, and I did. So that was, I, I wrote an article on that sent from uh, Los Angeles, um, and, but that was just a start. And I've written many times on, about their work, about his work, um, whether for monographs or articles for various publications. He's always produced buildings that I couldn't quite anticipate. He, he's led the high rise to different places, leading clients, setting the bar very high for the field always with a, a spirit of inquiry and, and trial and, and, uh, and progress. So whether it was the classic 333 Wacker Drive in Chicago, Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati, the DG Bank in Frankfurt, uh, the World Bank in Washington, Gannett Headquarters in McLean, Virginia, Brew College here in Manhattan still hasn't really been written about, One Jackson Square in Manhattan still hasn't really been written about, Shanghai World Financial International Commerce Center in Hong Kong, um, uh, and now the Hudson Yards, um, all uh, quite special buildings uh, and, uh, and buildings that, that in some way changed the field. Uh, I've written about all these buildings, and they've been a pleasure to visit and a pleasure to write about, uh, full of ideas, invention, detail, heart, consideration. For selfish reasons, the better the building, the better my articles uh, and essays. They always make me look good. Uh, so I, I just absorb their IQ and their grace and pass it off on as my own. So, so thank you, Bill. <laughs> 
Um, if you're in this room, you already know about his stature, but for the sake of completeness, let me just cite one or two credentials before I get into what I really want to say. So let me embarrass, him, embarrass Bill by citing some of his awards. He's received no less than seven National Design Awards for, for work that he's directed. The, the Council for Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat awarded the Shanghai World Financial Center as the best tall building in the world in 2009, uh, in my view, I, and I just saw it about uh, six months ago, it's a masterpiece. On a personal level, way back in 1965, before he even became Bill Pedersen, he won the Rome Prize in Architecture, and then the Arnold Bruner Memorial Prize for the, for, from the American Academy and the National Institute of Arts and Letters. He won the University of Minnesota's Alumni Achievement Award, and very recently, just a couple of weeks ago, the Medal of Honor from the AIA of New York. Um, after writing about architects and their buildings uh, for three decades now, I've been fascinated by the fact that inescapably architects build their own character. Uh, an up uptight architect will build an uptight building. A generous architect will inevitably build gener generosity. Bill is no exception, and it's insightful to quote his value system about buildings because they really do apply to himself. They reveal his character. He said, and he'll probably uh, tell you more about this in, in his talk, he has said that he believes that buildings should gesture and connect to the community in an architectural conversation. But my whole career has been about uh, taking buildings uh, that are inherently autonomous and getting them to become social gestures, um, starting conversations. So that's what he does. He listens to his clients. He comes to student reviews. He's come to mine. He listens to the students. I've seen him. He listens to his colleague, colleagues. Uh, then he adds something to the conversation. He's not autonomous. He, he's involved, always considerate. He builds that character into his buildings. They're always connecting to the, to the environment. He believes that the high-rise commercial office building is a fundamental building block of the modern city uh, and one that should treat it with respect. So the building is a citizen and so is, build, uh, so is Bill. He's a citizen in his office, instrumental in building a, a leading corporation that's functional. Not, he's not autocratic. He's a founding partner, but remains a building block, very active. The citizen supporting his colleagues, delegating authority, pleased when a colleague does well, uh, always giving, cre giving credit. He believes that the super tall building should be serene. It should have a composure, perhaps nobility. It shouldn't be competitive. Um, uh, he should, it shouldn't add to the cacophony. He's, he's building, um, uh, built himself as building one of the most tense, intense uh, arenas in the world and does so with great grace under pressure. He doesn't compete for attention. He's self-assured. His own calm becomes the building's calm. Uh, your, so your buildings can't, as, uh, as architects, your buildings can't really escape your character. Uh, um, and in Bill's case, they don't need to, you don't want them to. Uh, he builds who he is. Bill, in a world, uh, in a word, is a building, or at least one of his buildings, responsible, committed, communicative, supporting. Um, my daughter once complained uh, that it's been a disaster growing up in our household uh, with supportive parents, good school, f closet full. How can she grow into the artist she wants to be if she hasn't suffered, if she's not neurotic? <laughs> so uh, my, my, wife, my wife pointed out that uh, Meryl Streep had a happy child and, and, and emerged a great actor, actress. Uh, I, point, I pointed out to Bill Pedersen, considerate, calm, supportive, um, who dis despite his stability and good nature is a great architect. Um, so uh, seems to me uh, he's, um, he's no Howard Rourke and doesn't need to be. He's uh, in, in no, in no <laughs> ego. <laughs> so um, let me introduce Bill. Thank you. Joseph, <clears throat> thank you. One receives an introduction like that once in a lifetime, and I think I've, I've gotten mine. <laughs> We've been friends for a long time, and uh, Joseph and I have uh, spent many, many hours, many lunches talking about uh, architecture and, uh, and in many diverse ways. He himself is an architect who has designed extraordinary structures and has a very clear personal aesthetic. But the, the great pleasure of working with Joseph and talking with Joseph that he's so interested in trying to understand a a variety of approaches to the, uh, the problems of architecture. So today, I am going to talk to you about the high-rise commercial speculative office building, <laughs> called, a, um, called a, a machine which makes the land pay by Cass Gilbert. Uh, it nevertheless is a structure which is, I consider, and Joseph has already mentioned it, the fundamental building block of the modern city. 
And so unless we find ways to bring its autonomous and insular nature into a more social dialogue with the context, uh, we're going to have some, uh, our, our cities will never be able to achieve, I think, the, the potential that they deserve to achieve. So with that, I, I have this, uh, a role of architecture is to create relationships. Um, and uh, this slide, of course, can be used to describe almost anything in life, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 will, uh, I will use it to describe uh, my intentions. Uh, buildings, very simply, uh, need to talk to each other. Uh, buildings need to talk with their context. They need to be able to find ways of embracing each other, unlike the human body, which has the purity of the anatomy, but it has the ability also to be able to gesture. Uh, buildings can't quite do that. And so as an architect, one has to somewhat make a decision. Is one determined to create uh, buildings, and particularly tall buildings with extremely pure anatomies, or is one, in fact, desirous of creating a different type of gestural relationship? And clearly, I have uh, come down on the side of the latter. So uh, with that, let me just briefly run through New York City and some of its influences, 1916 and the Hugh Ferris magnificent images of the Step Act zoning, which for me initiated, uh, and for all of us, initiated the, somewhat of a golden age in American commercial architecture. The, the ability of buildings to combine as a result of the Step Back in itself uh, was extraordinary, and then that, when that was combined, in fact, with elements of classical, classical derivation, uh, the, the combination and the continuity of the urban fabric was generally taken to a very high point, and the highest point it ever achieved was the Rockefeller Center, from my per personal uh, viewpoint. Uh, the extraordinary ability for these buildings to uh, render uh, an almost geological power uh, starting for the French and English buildings at the base, which could be thought of as foothills and ascending up to the nobility of the great crown. Uh, this building and this complex of buildings joined so effortlessly with its surrounding context that as you walk by it today, you know, it almost uh, doesn't in interrupt or intrude in any way, and yet when one is enveloped within it, it's an extraordinary experience. So that um, is architecturally the accomplishment, and how was it accomplished? And when Rem Kulas calls this a masterpiece without a genius, uh, that of course gives me hope, because uh, it shows that in fact uh, maybe we can all create things of, of value, it's a question of how one does it. And uh, uh, the collaboration that was brought about by Rockefeller Center was extraordinary. Not only Whitman and Rockefeller himself, but obviously Raymond Hood, who was a, an excellent architect, but perhaps not a genius. He was a great, he was a good architect. I wouldn't call him a great architect, but the collaboration of these people brought everybody to a height that they had never achieved on their own. And so that aspect of it alone is something I find is extraordinarily sympathetic to the manner in which our entire team is structured for Hudson Yards. And so it becomes a model for the manner in which we work. Now, um, right on the heels of Rockefeller Center, of course, the international style takes over. The plaza zoning, which brings about uh, buildings somewhat divorced from their context. And when Lou Kahn said that it is better to do the right thing poorly than the wrong thing well, to me, this is an excellent example of that. Uh, both of these buildings done by geniuses, Eero Sarnen and Mies van der Rohe, uh, but both of these buildings, in my view, from an urban perspective, the wrong thing done extremely well. And when the wrong thing is done badly, uh, one gets this. Uh, and so that really becomes sort of the context upon which uh, we begin our work. Um, over the years, I've worked on tall buildings even as a student. Uh, there are only three people in this room that recognize the upper left-hand corner slide, and, and uh, one of them is my wife, and the other is my friend Marvin Melser, who is uh, in the front row over here. He's my classmate from the University of Minnesota. And uh, so the tall building, although not my destiny, nevertheless was always an interest, and uh, th this represents six decades of work on the tall building. Um, 
So just briefly to take you through the buildings as they try to create gestural relationships with their context, 333 Wacker Drive in Chicago, uh, in Frankfurt, uh, the DG Bank, which has two very dissimilar contexts. One is which is a residential context and the other is a commercial context. And the building takes on two faces to respond to those two different contexts, as it does in Montreal with uh, 1250 Rennie Levesque, which gestures to the city in one way and gestures to the surrounding context in another. And you can see sort of the joinery between those two uh, elements in themselves. Uh, in Hawaii, the first Hawaiian bank gestures to the mountains with the solidity and, dressed, and gestures to the sea with the uh, glazed surface. So uh, again, a preoccupation to as how one responds to the specific context, introducing a relationship to an intense experience of entry uh, in Seoul, Korea. Uh, and over a skyline for Samsung Electronics headquarters, designing buildings which uh, in a cluster of buildings try to gesture across space to each other through a series of overlapping uh, horizontal volumes. And you can see the nature of that overlap taking place here. Um, when the context becomes a little bit more uh, remote, and the building becomes a little bit larger, the dialogue between the volume itself and the, and the surrounding context is more difficult to achieve. And when one has a situation of that type, at least it's my intention, to try to give a building a very serene presence. And this is the case of the Shanghai World Financial Center, where the building is in intended to be able to create a dialogue between the earth and the sky. And the earth and in the Chinese mythology, or not mythology, but actual artifacts are represented by square prisms and the sky represented by circular disks. And what we simply did was to take a square prism and slice it with this great sort of cosmic arc, uh, creating then the, the gesture which combines those two things. And as it hits the earth, it becomes quite connected to the earth. And as it comes to the sky, this bridge across becomes a sort of a public uh, ceremony uh, that enables one to take advantage of that spectacular spot in the context. And finally, in uh, uh, Hong Kong, out on the island of Kowloon, again, a fairly remote context, as one can see, uh, the introduction of an extraordinarily simple building which meets the ground uh, in a way that we like to believe is somewhat inspired by conditions of the regional uh, context. Uh, the, the shingled glass wall that you see here is something that uh, we have carried over to Hudson Yards, so, uh, and we've carried it over specifically because it re, re, uh, receives light. And I'll go back to the previous slide. It receives light in such an extraordinary way. Uh, even we were surprised by its, the characteristics of it. And now as it gestures over towards the, to the central of uh, uh, Hong Kong. So that brings us in as uh, quickly as I possibly can to, uh, to New York City and to, to Hudson Yards, and uh, the uh, obligations and the opportunities. Worked a very long time on tall buildings all over the world, and I've never had an opportunity that can come close to equaling this. Uh, in, in some respects, I consider this to be the final exam, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> now there may be more to come, but who knows. Uh, uh, but it has been um, a, a tremendous uh, opportunity for me as now a New Yorker after 47 years, uh, and also the, the opportunity to work with a, a series of extraordinary people that have shaped this with as much determination as any of us. So, um, the New West Side, Hudson Yards. Um, a very important slide, and I'm going to sort of pause from this frenetic pace here to talk a little bit about these individuals, because this is sort of the corollary to the slide I showed you for Rockefeller Center. Um, there's no um, way one could talk about anything involved in the West Side without talking about Mayor Bloomberg, the Bloomberg administration, uh, Amanda Burden, city planning. Uh, it, uh, the last you know, 10 or 11 years have been extraordinary, I believe, for New York City. The manner in which the whole West Side development was established, it was a tremendously, uh, uh, I think, a, a tremendous accomplishment. Mayor Bloomberg, with the introduction of the extension of the number seven line, uh, understanding uh, the importance of that connection to the city. Uh, Canary Wharf, as you may remember, didn't have that connection for many, many years. And as a result, the entire development languished. 
Um, Amanda Burden, the results of the, the High Line and the great success of the High Line is one of her many accomplishments. And of course, uh, Robert and Joshua, uh, the gentlemen that made that High Line possible. Uh, I, I, the High Line and the success of the High Line, I think for us was a tremendous windfall, somewhat unanticipated at the beginning of the project because its success had not been fully realized. Now, the, the gentleman in the bottom row, um, that's, these are the gentlemen that I interact with on a daily basis. And uh, Jay Cross on the right-hand side, who's sitting in the front row, um, I want to talk a little bit about because um, Jay, um, in addition to being, uh, having studied nuclear physics and a variety of other esoteric subjects, is a great sailor. He was an Olympian three times for Canada. But most importantly, he designed the, what is known as the Cross 14. It's an international 14, which won the world championship in 1985. His boat. And, or was it 86, Jerry? I, I, I'm, getting, I'm close, 85, OK. <laughs> Well, what's so important about this is that the design of a boat is obviously a visual thing. But a designer of a boat is only interested in performance past the visual. And I believe that that preoccupation with performance is something that very much extends into Jay's attitude and relationship with us as, as architects. The, the desire to make every act aspect of the building respond in terms of its, its value and its performance drives our entire team and inspires our entire team. And this is the sort of dialogue that we've had now for the last two and a half years. The gentleman in the middle, Kenneth Himmel, heads all of the retail development related. Uh, Time Warner is his product. He's done retail developments all over the world. I worked with Ken in the early 80s in Boston on 101 Federal Street on a development that had no retail within it. But uh, Ken is an extraordinarily sensitive individual towards the dynamics of the retail world, towards the dynamics of creating a place which makes people feel like they really enjoy it. And that is the, sort of the essence of it all. And on the left-hand side, uh, Stephen Ross, who is the chairman of, of, of Related, and has built uh, in New York, as you all know, a, a great number of structures that have contributed to the city, and obviously the Time Water Center. Um, he is very, very uh, fundamental to the design process. His desires, his likes, his dislikes, and his uh, acute observation of, of design is something that guides us through the entire process. So we're not working in isolation as architects. We're working with these three gentlemen in a way that their, their contributions to design are as much as our contributions are to design. And it's that sort of dialogue for us that it makes, it makes the, the making of architecture um, an entirely different experience. We believe that, uh, yes, one, we have to have an extraordinarily intense involvement with ourselves and our own internal collaborative process. But the ability to be able to achieve a, a, an intense dialogue with one's client in such a way that they participate in the design process with us is essential. And then fundamentally, uh, finally, a collaboration with the site and its characteristics. And that is what I'm going to try to document for you now. Um, here is the uh, extended site. The little white line is the actual boundary of, of Hudson Yards from 10th Avenue to 12th, uh, 11th Avenue running right through it. As you can see, the, the high line coming up from the south, coming down from the north, is, is the uh, extension of the seven line. Uh, the uh, entire site sits, of course, directly on top of the train tracks, which you all know about already. Uh, this is the potential rezoning of the west side. All of the blue numbers are uh, commercial. Uh, all of the red are residential, and all of the, the orange are industrial. So as you can see, the intensity of development on the west side is going to be extraordinary. And uh, our site, which is, uh, has the 11 FAR associated with it, which is called the Eastern Yards, uh, probably has one of the lowest uh, FARs of the entire area. 
this is the specific boundary, the eastern yards and the western yards. Uh, the uh, eastern yards, as you can see, 2.7 million square feet, of which about 5 million is in, in uh, commercial space, uh, residential space of about a million, cultural space of about 200,000, and retail of, of about 700,000 in between. Our, the blue area is the area in question tonight. This is the, uh, the, this is the zone that we're working within. And um, uh, all of that then is going to be very much influenced by the, the movement from the south of the High Line. Uh, the, as you can see, the, the, the success of that, uh, the, the first and second phase is already completed. And then as it arrives at our site, uh, we are going to be uh, getting the High Line moving east and west and coming directly underneath our entire development. So that the integration of it uh, and the opportunity to be able to connect with this umbilical cord which links the entire complex to the south uh, is a fantastic opportunity and one of the primary responses what we're obligated to maximize. Uh, you know now how that all is fleshing out and, and uh, what it has become from the perspective of the de development of the whole uh, uh, Chelsea neighborhood. Uh, the extension of the, the seven line, uh, as you can see here, is going to be ready in a couple of years. Uh, and the, the, its location on the northern border of our site uh, becomes something that we also have a, a, a keen interest in relating to. So this is the first um, attempt at our, our master plan. Uh, three buildings, um, three buildings uh, in a relationship which is uh, uh, imaginatively considered A, B, and C. And uh, the um, culture shed, which was designed by Diller Scafidio and Renfro, was uh, somewhat, somewhat preceded the development of the master plan uh, as an entity in itself. And so its positioning, which originally sort of oriented itself uh, uh, towards the north and gestured towards the north, uh, was obviously uh, something that potentially would come into conflict with the nature of a space that would flow from uh, east to west all the way down to the river. So the reorientation of that uh, as a component that uh, completes the ensemble uh, was something that was uh, uh, initiated in, in the early stages. This was what the, uh, uh, that th uh, ensemble of three buildings looked like. Uh, but the relationship of three buildings was soon changed to a relationship of two buildings, two major commercial buildings. And the dialogue and the balance created between two buildings or the creation of the relationship between three buildings is quite a different thing. Uh, and I um, then I started to think I've been doing oh, over the last two or three years a lot of exercises, which I call my sort of visual scales, if you can refer to the, uh, the musical world, but uh, exercises in balancing. And uh, uh, the, the, the contraposto comes in a little bit later in the game here. But I do the, these rock uh, compositions, which are all done without any uh, mechanical connection at all, but try to achieve a balancing point in a way that they create within themselves a dynamic relationship. And here, of course, uh, somewhat doctored with my photography, the relationship of two towers. So, uh, but the contraposto of the, the body uh, generated by this uh, image uh, is, is something that has always been an important um, driver in terms of the dynamic of, of the tall building in my own mind. The, answer, the desire to be able to create a certain energy in it, and yet at the same time a level of repose. And obviously you know the, the, the compositional aspect of the, of the strong vertical, which sort of anchors then the, the, the ability of the diagonals to be able to uh, relate to that in a, in a way which uh, enables it to generate a, a sort of an intense series of triangulations which um, well, everybody knows the success of that. So that is, um, when we're working with two buildings then, the uh, creation of a relationship of two buildings becomes the key issue, but the creation of the first building or a building that responds specifically to the programmatic requirements was a major driver. This complex was to and is to achieve the most efficient office buildings in the city of New York. The rental market is an extraordinarily competitive place. 
uh, and the ability to be able to provide a high quality, dimensionally adequate environment uh, is something that is, is sort of the basis of everything that we've done in, the, in design here. And so the vertical tall building, when it gets to the heights that we're talking about, tends to have a series of elevator banks which drop off about every 15 floors. As you can see, they start to release space as they drop off, and as a result, the creation then of a, a wall which follows that, the dropping off of the elevator banks seem like a natural way uh, to create the initial gesture of form. And then on the right-hand side, when you put two of them together, then the opportunity of them to establish a relationship with each other and gesture in one case to the, the river and the other case to the city provides sort of the initial dynamic upon which the entire composition is based. And as one then revolves around it all, uh, the opportunity for these two buildings to have constantly changing uh, relationships as one moves around it uh, and for the buildings to, uh, it sounds a little bit corny, but to create, to create almost a dance uh, as, as one moves about them uh, was the intention. But that's speaking specifically about the relationships of the two buildings. Now, um, before we go too much farther, embedded within all of this frivolity uh, is an incredibly complex uh, uh, operation and made even more complex by the fact that we're, as you know, building over train tracks, uh, and those train tracks have to stay in operation uh, during the entire construction process. And so I can point to the, that there's a train coming under the river, there are the tracks right there. This is a whole series of transfer trusses which enable all of that structure to come down and be transferred out over all of this. It's, uh, Within it, uh, it's an exceedingly complex proposition, and we have represented in the office, uh, or not in the office, in the audience here, uh, many people that have been spending their entire um, working time dealing with all of the complexities of, of this uh, particular platform condition. But tonight, the issue really isn't to talk about the complexities of the building from that perspective, although that could be a, an interesting subject in itself but just talking about the relationship of the, of, of the buildings to the overall uh, organization of the site. This is the eastern yards. That is the potential development of the western yards. As you can see, the major axis moving to the river, the other axis coming from Hudson Boulevard, coming in from the north. Our two buildings, one on the north, the taller of the two anchoring this corner in relationship to the subway, the, the lower of the two anchoring the south, southeastern corner in relationship to the spur. So they're speaking across space uh, is, is a fundamental uh, issue. Uh, the other two buildings then, two, both residential buildings, uh, Diller, Scopitio, and Renfrew doing this building, and the culture shed, which has been reoriented so that its movement parallels that of the spur. And the, this facade and that facade then both become dramatic elements in the participation of this entire sequence. This building done by David Childs of SOM becomes a pivotal piece that enables the entire composition then uh, to turn out to the river. So just looking at some of the responsibilities, the red lines that we've generated here are lines which are intended to act as facades, which form potentially a, a great urban room. The components of that room are, uh, have yet to be fully developed, but that uh, the importance is that the architecture establishes a backdrop which will support that room and form that room in, in its clarity. This room, in relationship to these two buildings, becomes an important forecourt as one enters in and as one comes off then of the Highland. As you can see, the Highland moves underneath the building itself. But this particular diagram is an attempt to explain to you all of the responses that the, the, the complex makes to the particular points of contact uh, that it engage, en engages with the city. One, it was asked of me at one time, what, what makes this a, a New York building? And um, you know, that's a question that is, is uh, somewhat subjective. My only answer for it is that the building 
makes an attempt to respond to every specific situation that it, it engages. And as such, in responding to those conditions, hopefully becomes so much part of this fabric of the city that it, it by definition, becomes uh, a, a, a building connected to its place. But these specific um, um, corners that are of concern, the relationship to the spur, particularly the relationship to the High Line coming up from the south and how that is received, uh, the movement into the plaza, the dialogue and the engagement of these two structures together, the creation of the facade I've already mentioned here, the engagement with the number seven line on that corner, how that reception is made, the engagement of these pieces on the corner of 10th Avenue and 33rd Street, and how that anchors that particular bomb. And then, of course, the manner in which the two sort of speak across uh, space to each other. So here you can see then the, the, the relationships as they start to emerge. When we've started in, in our first presentations that Jay and I made, uh, the building was essentially a form of this type right here. Coach got involved. Uh, they just wanted to rent about 700,000 square feet, but they didn't want to be uh, in an, a commercial office building. They wanted to have a campus. Well, creating a campus in a, in a single building seemed to be somewhat of an initial challenge, but the uh, potential then of taking a void and creating a room of gathering for the entire coach community by faulting off a portion of this building here enabled that then to become the, the axis uh, as it responded to the High Line and this piece then to become an element that ultimately works in scale with the culture shed and I'll show you that later. Um, so this is, the, this is sort of the timeline of how that particular building evolved. We, we started at the very beginning over here and with the purity of that form and as we move through a series of uh, evolutionary steps, uh, finally coming to a point where we had faulted the piece off, as you can see here. But then uh, later, we lost to some, of, uh, some area on the top of the building, and the building dropped a bit in its height. But that is sort of the process. And one of the things that I need to talk about in terms of the commercial office building is that this is something that is engaged in a constant dialogue with a changing series of participants. The, uh, the fact that if one is to achieve a pure form and then subject that pure form to a series of participants that need different dimensional conditions, different amounts of space and whatever, one is dealing with a very difficult circumstance. And that's why Going way back to the step back buildings, these buildings were extraordinarily flexible as tools that could adjust themselves to the different demands of the marketplace. We've had to uh, do exactly the same thing with numerous tenants then requesting uh, a different uh, spatial responses. But all in all, here we are at, at somewhat a, a conclusion, although one never knows. And uh, <laughs> this. Uh, <laughs> One of the relationships I'm most proud of is the relationship with the culture shed in this piece, and the culture shed is in its closed position here, but the, the, the ensemble of that entire piece seems to me to be somewhat of a complete composition. Um, looking up, up the axis of the High Line, uh, the, looking down the axis of the High Line from the coach uh, atrium itself, um, looking at the corner over the spur, the manner in which the building uh, sort of generates a face to that, and as you can see how that has been uh, determined as one moves underneath the building, a 60-foot high aperture, allowing then the movement of the High Line to go directly uh, beneath it uh, along 30th Street and its relationship to the High Line as it threads itself through. Uh, and then as it comes out on the plaza facing Towards the culture shed, the um, uh, entrance for the coach lobby, which is one part of the, the, the entrance sequence. The other uh, portion of the entrance sequence is for a second and third tenant to, to occupy an entirely different spatial experience. So going around um, the, the buildings in the modern um, the demands of the retail rental place, um, the all-glass office building is uh, an inevitability at this point in time. 
the, there's an increased density of occupation. Now they're talking about 150 square feet per person. Uh, in many of these uh, organizations that potentially will occupy these spaces, the demand for natural light and the quantity of natural light is increasing all of the time. So the 45-foot dimension of space from court outside wall that I mentioned to you, but the entire wall of glass is, is very much a demand. So uh, with that, the elements of the glass wall and how they're treated, I mentioned to you the shingled surface that we've been developing. Uh, for a good portion of the building. Uh, these are uh, relationships of different shingled surfaces, one on the right for coach, uh, for the, that coach bustle. The other is the primary wall, the, uh, the stepping wall. These are the three together, a flat wall, a shingled wall, and then a double shingled wall. And the coach atrium. Uh, the facade is ad addresses the main plaza. Uh, this is something that will be undergoing a lot of investigation. Jamie Carpenter is going to be working with us on all of this. Uh, but it is, becomes a potentially dramatic surface that does not have the obligation of revealing all of the retail activity behind it, because the retail activity behind it is going to happen as, a, as one enters into the room behind. And none of the specific identity of the components on front is, uh, in front is, uh, is sought. Uh, as one goes then to on the north side of the building, you can see the, the effect of that vertical dowel that anchors the composition, relates to the entrance directly off of the subway. The piece on the corner, it's it, uh, on uh, 33rd and 10th, and the response there uh, taking place at the, at the lower level. Someone asked Jay Cross in the previous presentation about 10 days ago, what's the experience at the, for the first 100 feet? Well, the experience for the first 100 feet, obviously, as you all know, is absolutely crucial. And the manner in which that sort of receives the scale of the pedestrian is uh, the, the key to it all. Um, the 10th Avenue facade, uh, a little bit lagging behind in terms of its development, but uh, the anchoring of the street at the corner and that room, then as it gestures out towards the city itself, uh, potentially a, a room of, of some interest. So um, now, uh, uh, coming to the top of the building as it generates its relationship to the, the, the city itself, um, a very uh, substantial uh, observation uh, complex is uh, anticipated. Uh, the dominant piece on the observation deck is a cantilever of about 80 feet out into space that one can come out onto, uh, looking out over the city, and then a series of ballrooms and bars and a crow's nest even up on the top here. We, one can go up to on an elevator past the mass damper uh, for the building, which will be hanging like a great pendulum in, in space. So uh, that's the view from on top. And this is the uh, composition as it sits now in present isolation, but we'll have plenty of uh, participants to join it in the future. So, thank you. So in an act of arrogance, uh, is it on? Hello? Yeah, in an act of arrogance, we're going to rob you of 15 minutes uh, since we started about 10 minutes late. Um, uh, the, um, well, congratulations, Bill. It's very impressive. Um, before we start talking about your contribution and your building itself, can you in some way um, tell us about what the city did to support this huge effort? Because it's really much bigger than Rockefeller Center. It's a huge thing. Um, what kind of infra infrastructure did they do? I know they invested $3 billion. This would not be possible without kind of the governmental support that um, a project like this needs. Can you briefly uh, go into that? Well, the, uh, I, I'm less cognizant of all of the specific steps than certainly Jay is, but there was, a, I thought, an extraordinary dialogue that took place 10, 10 days ago in, in this venue here. Uh, Dan Doktoroff representing the city uh, and, and Jay, of course, representing the uh, private development. And what was most impressive uh, was the understanding of the responsibility of government and how the government needs to lay the groundwork for, the, for private enterprise to participate. And all of the steps that made it possible for this development to take place were anticipated years in advance. And the number seven line, of course, was uh, the, the biggest of them. I don't know if you know the history of the site, but 
Dan Doktoroff led the, the movement for 2012, which was for the New York Olympic bid. And Jay and I worked very closely on the stadium for that for about four years, uh, which was to be the Olympic Stadium. Uh, of course, that didn't succeed, but in this process, the entire uh, area that you saw under um, redevelopment, uh, that all of that was established, Joseph, uh, during that point in time. As a matter of fact, the diagram I showed you was the original diagram, which had the 11 FAR on our eastern yards, but on the western yards, it was left open because it was anticipated the stadium be, be there. So um, th 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 that is the, the sort of the, 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 the genesis of it, that impetus, I believe, Jay, if that is as accurate, that the, the 2012 was really the driving force behind the whole thing. But they've also rezoned the entire area, so it's, it's much larger than the Hudson Yards site, so it's part of oh, a larger whole. Well, that, but that was a product of that whole, the whole thing was rezoned at that point right. in time. Yeah. And then, of course, the, the line number seven is coming in. It's, uh, without that, uh, n none of it would be possible. Right. But the, the thing that I've always said is that so much of the uh, so much of the decision making process as to uh, the, the involvement with this particular Hudson Yard site took place prior to the understanding of the success of the High Line. Mm -hmm. And when that was revealed, sort of after all the commitments had been made, it was a windfall for the site because that, that the High Line itself is to me the most dramatic ingredient which we have to participate with. Well, it seems that there are two scales, because you have the skyline, which, which uh, uh, I mean, the high line, excuse me, which brings you to the south, and and, uh, and Chelsea is to a certain extent a boutique, boutique area, it's a smaller scale, it's not small scale, but it's, let's say, medium scale. And then you have the seven coming in, and all those huge buildings to the north. So you have a multiple scale, which is, is very interesting, actually. It's, you, this slide is somewhat transitional. And it is um, the, the wall that is, uh, I should call it a wall, but the, the face, uh, which we have on the south, uh, which uh, with our, which we call Building C, uh, and then the residential building and the culture shed. The dynamics of, I think, that face as it relates towards Chelsea, sort of is it breaks itself sort of down. ideally yes. set up to, be, to create that dialogue. You uh -huh. know, it doesn't create a, an impermeable wall, but one of invitation. Yeah. Right, right. Um, it seems that uh, I, uh, you, you touched a bit on the process, the design process uh, with Coach, and, and it was quite fascinating that you uh, broke down um, the Coach components. So there's a building within a building, building nested within the building, and within that building there's a campus. And I know in, in Baruch you also created an interior campus. Um, uh, but it seems uh, what's interesting to me is, is as I said, pointed out in my introduction, that you listen to the client and. The impact of that is is you broke down what might have otherwise been a pure form, and so it's not a prismatic form like the Seagram's building or the Saradin's building. It's something that's broken apart. Um, can you describe a little bit about that? It seems that the space is in some way fungible. You're you're acting as a shortstop. You know, you're, you're getting a quick hit and you're throwing it to first, and you're, you, it's very reactive. Well, it's, you know, it, it's there's a little. Uh, there's a relationship between uh, improvisational theater and, 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 and architecture, you know? Uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, that, those, those stones that I, I compose, I start with one stone and then I add another stone that might relate to that stone and then I find a third stone yeah. that, yeah. and that's pretty much what we do, you know? The, yeah. the, the, and then we look for opportunities and every one of these sort of fissures that you get in the purity of the, of the diagram represents an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the coach, the coach involvement was the greatest opportunity we've had for the project mm -hmm. because that enabled us to create a building that, that was responsive, mm -hmm. that we couldn't respond in any other legitimate way than to, by creating that atrium. But it seems and, you've, shel you've shelved Euclid. He's not, he's not. Uh, the <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's, it's it, you know, it was at one point in time a great interest of mine, the, the, the at, at, uh, anatomical purity of buildings was, uh, but mm -hmm. I, I've, I've 
I find that so unachievable in, in the real world, and, and so I've given up on that. And then <laughs> I said, look, uh, however you did do it in China, not to, uh, to lead you into a contradiction, but um, in China, and Sh Shanghai is, is quite pure, very beautiful, and it's, it's also um, uh, multi-use, uh, there's hotels. Well, there's yeah, but then we had some challenges there, too. You know, I had this beautiful, well, I called it a beautiful cylinder at the top of the building, mm -hmm. you know, and then there was an enormous... Uh, sort of political upheaval that, that challenged that uh, gesture as well, so that, uh, huh. but. Uh, well, uh, I, uh, Danny Leviskin said at one point that, uh, about the Leaning Tower of Pizza, uh, Pizza that, um, excuse me, that they designed it that way. It wasn't, didn't just lean over time, they really wanted it, and, and, and you've achieved this, you've actually designed it leaning. Which, uh, which is really quite radical. You don't look like a radical. You're, you're well dressed, very well mattered. But, but what you've done is you've, you've broken the purity of this Euclidean prism down. First of all, with the coach and all these fissures, what you call fissures, right. um, and you've created these interior sp interior spaces that are that are small villages, uh, campuses, um, and then you lean the whole thing. And I remember other architects who are also doing uh, big big uh, towers in New York who talk about the necessity of symmetry. This is not a sym symmetrical building. So, despite the fact that that it, you're, you're presenting this in a, a very sort of soft shoe way, uh, it's quite radical, actually. And, and even even the way it, it looks on the on the uh, in the skyline is. Well, I don't want my know, clients to think I'm a radical. Yes, right. right. <laughs> <That's> right. <Sorry. laughs> Nobody in this room can tell anybody outside the room, please. This Wait. Isn't, oh, you knew it. <laughs> we, we had this long conversation. Joseph and I had this conversation about the destabilizing quality of this building, you know, and I said, oh, no, we can't use that word. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> But when you look at the the cross section, is you know it's, it's it's very convincing, it's quite straight and all that. But the appearance isn't, and um, uh, and it really just does energize the skyline. It kind of establishes its own field for, field force, force, well, uh, force of field, <laughs> field of forces. Sorry. Uh, well, the um, uh, at one point in time, I was bold enough to talk about the the relationship of these two buildings. Um, as it connected to West Side Story, I shouldn't. I shouldn't even admit this. This is this is all off the record here. But you know, if you think of two buildings and the two so, yeah. you know, camps and the Montagues and the Capulets and all that sort of <laughs> thing, that uh, uh -huh. <laughs> there is a little bit. And I just had an interview before this this uh, presentation, and boy, that one really rang a bell. So I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Got to make something yeah. out of that. But I I, I really um, like the fact that they're dancing, uh, but it seems that um, it's the other buildings have not been invited into the dance, or at least the, the, the invitation has been turned down. The other ones are self-contained, self somewhat static. They're geometrically um, closed. Other than the shed, well, of course. You know, we, 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 at, at, your, at your jury at Pratt, you know, mm -hmm. this young fellow started to talk about buildings in a dance, and he had three buildings, and, mm -hmm. and it was, it's hard to dance with three. It's easier to dance oh, yes, with two, you know. So. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> Um, let's see. Oh, the master plan. You, you, you did the master plan, didn't you, for the whole thing? The city did the master plan. I see. The, the, the master plan evolved out of the competition for the, the, the MTA held for the I site. See. There were about four or five architects responding to that. I believe that the, the, the basic criteria of the master plan, when I showed you all those the numbers up there, yeah, yeah. that was all developed by the city. So you're responsible just for the, the eastern part? We are responsible time. for the eastern part, and the western part will be evolving. The, the, you know, there's uh -huh. a singular gesture now to the river. How that gesture is, is fleshed out over the years uh, you know, will take a lot of twists in the road. Well, it seems at a certain point there was a fork in the road, and, and um, as I understand it in the competition, rather than um, uh, doing a, uh, a single architect who had, did the, kind of the, all the design, uh, you know, one one author, uh, the um, the developers decided to go to uh, with the idea of mixing mixing authorship and, and yes. mixing you know mixing the company, the firms that were dealing with it. As a result, um, you you've got the um, Rockefeller Center kind of breathing down your neck, looking over your shoulder, and I mean that's a masterpiece, obviously, without a. Um, a, a genius, um, but you're not doing that. This is different. So, what have you lost, and what have you gained by mixing uh, mixing the firms? Well, the the, the the obvious gain, I think, is in uh, one of potential energy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that one one has to look at uh, what has happened since Rockefeller Center. I mean, a number of things uh, have happened to the the 
commercial office building since Rockefeller Center. Number one is the depth from the court outside wall. And I keep talking about dimensions, but they're totally, uh, they're, they're the fundamental point of departure. And we've increased those dimensions by at least 10 to 15 feet from Rockefeller Center. Uh, that is one. The second is the issue and the desire on the part of the marketplace to create identity. And the fact that all of the buildings essentially look like they're from the same hand and from the same uh, cloth at Rockefeller Center is not a marketing advantage. Mm -hmm. And so that's a dynamic that we're facing everywhere, uh, in, in Canary Wharf and Rapungi, everywhere. That is the dynamic of the modern city. And really, how these diverse parts respond to each other you know, is the potential energy of the, of, of the, the composition. And uh, this composition has yet to be fully played out because the expectation of the component that anchors the, the, the center of that void is very high and is something that is going to be given a tremendous amount of attention. You have um, to call back Michelangelo for that. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it'll come to your time. Um, the, uh, so it's a different paradigm. It says it's more New York than it's less Rock Rockefeller Center in uh, terms of the individuality of the buildings. Well, uh, I, let me just talk about the, the, the gestures that I was addressing tonight. Yeah. Um, I believe those gestures are uh, in, the, uh, in the character of those that are uh, uh, generated at Rockefeller Center yet. It's, it's quite a different condition, obviously, and we're dealing with a prismatic response as opposed to geological response. So it's, it's an entirely different world, but the, the, what is, we hold in common is the manner in which it all has come about in terms of the collective the process uh, and the desire to create something that fits uniquely into its place. And, uh, you know, <laughs> That, that bar is pretty high at Rockefeller Center, yeah. and, and, and it's an aspiration. Yeah. But what I find interesting about the, the fact that it leans and that you've broken the, uh, apart these prisons is it's no longer a centric project. Uh, it seems to be more radial or radiant. It seems to s sort of send energy out rather than sort of centering the, the whole thing. And I, I find mm -hmm. that that's very urbanizing. It engages the river, it engages even New, New Jersey. It's, um, uh, it's um, eccentric in the sense of out from the center rather than t toward the center. Well, I think that um, uh, the, the, the ability to speak outward, uh, outwardly to the context uh, and yet at the same time create intimacy of the center mm -hmm. is sort of the, the, the mm -hmm. that's the problem. And, and how one does that is, is uh, and the success of, of the manner in which those responses are made is, is uh, you know, uh, uh, the basis of this design. Yeah. You've done a lot of buildings in New York, and one that I regret not having written about uh, and not having read about is, is uh, Baruch College, which is one of the rare um, buildings in New York that has an uh, interior campus where there's a Z, where you really build a Z dimension so that you found an interior space in, in a building type that doesn't necessarily invite it. And I was um, quite heartened to see that um, you with the Coach have developed a campus inside that this should be socializing. Are there any other opportunities um, in your complex so far, or are you waiting for a client with, with a program? Well, no, the, the, the major opportunity will be within the retail uh, yeah. complex itself. That, that uh, and that's still evolving uh, programmatically, but that has the potential to be a room that is going to be a, sort of a salon for the city is what it amounts to. It's a, it's a place for everybody to gather. And uh, Ken Himmel has been very concerned about the, the dynamics of the programmatic juxtapositions which are going to bring about that sort of vitality in the, in the space mm -hmm. itself. Right? But still, I saw the, um, in your office uh, the, uh, kind of the top of the higher building, which looked like a, a self-contained building itself, sort of a building within the building. The, the top of the building is a building in itself. And that has a lot of what I consider sort of a Z space that, that socializes and rather than pancakes. It, it makes these connections. Um, and mm -hmm. also there's a corner uh, vignette on the north building which also has the, the, the verticalizing space. That, um, those, those two components, the more we can infuse uh, the, the, the private representation of these buildings with public events and, and, and public experiences, the richer they become. Um, I had a, a client, Mr. Mori in Japan, who understood this really well. 
Uh, and while we built massive uh, buildings that were the real workhorse of the financial uh, program, mm -hmm. uh, he articulated both the base and the, and the top with, with components that were essentially dedicated to the city, to the people of the city. And you know, I think that is the realization of that dynamic of how you bring the, the, the city into the, the private realm uh, is, is, is sort of the future of, of, of modern uh, uh, commercial development. But once you've brought the city into the private realm, realm it's, it's an issue of urbanizing the interior. Uh, because uh, if you just bring them into a pancake situation, it's, 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 it's not so socializing. Right. Well, the more, the more interconnected and the more <laughs> uh -huh. uh, interwoven that one can make these things, obviously, the, 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 yeah. the better. And, uh, but uh, the, uh, the reality is of, of, of certain um, sort of tenant obligations uh, sometimes uh, mitigate against it. So. I, I assume that the north uh, building is still under design and, and as you get, or as your, your, your clients get tenants, you might get more specific. It's all, all about the individuality, individuality of the contract, I would assume, and, and how you can tailor it. Exactly, and, and we were, Jay and I were just talking yesterday about how we could create a, a, a sort of an increased identity for the individual participants in that building, and particularly as they relate to the street, and particularly as it addresses 10th Avenue, because uh, uh, most of the energy on the building C is facing south and facing towards the river. Yeah. Building A sort of flips itself and addresses to the city, and, and, and giving 10th Avenue then a, a a, a sense of energy is something that we, we aspire yeah, to. Yeah, that's a tough avenue to crack because you have that you have that awful building in the back of it that, yeah. that uh, has a. Uh, well, my, my 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 prediction is that awful building is going to transform itself over time. It's, uh -huh. It 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 uh, you know it's a substantial piece of real estate and in sure. the right hands could be developed into something really. Exciting. Sure, if you animate your side of tenth, then it'll invite the other side to it, come along. It, it's a catalyst, and it, mm -hmm. and it really when you think of I mean just uh, to, to get off track here, but when you think of the west side and what happened when Lincoln Center went in, and then the entire influence that that has, this, the same thing is gonna happen here. Mm -hmm. I only regret I haven't bought any real estate over there. <laughs> 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 I, I, uh, there's, a, there's a community in Los Angeles, uh, Culver City, which doesn't have much density. The, the people park in the back, and they, they're, there's all the street furniture in the front, and it's, uh, got, it's over planted. But the fact that it's kind of overdone makes you feel that it's quite occupied, even though there are not that many people around. So, so, I, I, so I think architecture, qua architecture, it plays a certain role in urbanizing the uh, public space. Well, that's a very interesting point. I mean, how to make public space feel um, occupied when it's not occupied. <laughs> Uh, people tend to like to be at the edges of spaces. They feel uncomfortable in the center of the space. I think that the degree to which that, that room, that central room, is, it evolves is going to have this it, sort of a, it, as, as its primary aspiration, you know, how one feels comfortable being there in the large crowds and by oneself. And, and that, oh, time's up. <laughs> no, 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 you can finish your sentence. I'm done. Okay. <laughs>